So we're here from the Government 2.0 Expo here in Washington, D.C. with Chris Kemp, NASA's CTO for IT. So what does the new CTO for IT do these days? Well, I'm actually in the process of defining that. It's a newly created position, and uh, a few of the things that we know we'll be doing uh, are enterprise architecture. So I'll be responsible for understanding our current uh, IT environment and also thinking about what our future environment will look like. Uh, we'll also be focused on our open government initiatives. So in the open government portfolio, we have data.gov, we have our open source initiative, and there could be a few other uh, exciting initiatives that will uh, hopefully connect the public with what we're doing uh, as well. Uh, and then I guess the tertiary thing we're going to do is focus on labs. So we're going to have a few areas of focus where we will be doing prototype work, we're going to be looking at emerging technologies that are relevant to our mission customers, trying to understand them and trying to understand how we can um, get ahead of some of these things so that the CIO will be positioned to incorporate them in their future architecture and future services. So one of the things, uh, perhaps the thing, that you were doing before you became CTO was working as a CIO yes. um, on Nebula, which yes. is NASA's cloud computing solution. That, that's open source. Yes. What's happening with Nebula? What's the next steps in making that available to the rest of the government? Yeah. So we're in the process of expanding Nebula. Uh, Nebula uh, was only uh, a little pilot project out of Ames Research Center. Now we're expanding it with an East Coast pre presence at Goddard Space Flight Center. Uh, with Adrian Gardner, the CIO there. So Nebula has become a NASA program, and our goal is, is to provide Nebula to our scientists and our researchers uh, as a trial at no cost. So this is somewhat of a disruptive idea. Uh, we provide a network, a wide area network at no cost to everybody who works at NASA. We're looking at ways we can provide compute and storage as infrastructure services uh, to folks who work at NASA doing science and research at no cost. Now, when NASA says cloud computing, is this grid computing done over again? What makes this cloud? Yeah, I mean, I think there are a few differences. I mean, grid computing uh, requires that you ad adopt a certain architecture and framework with, with the code that you're writing. Uh, what makes cloud different is it builds on uh, metaphors like operating systems, file systems, storage, uh, platform APIs that you're already used to using. And so I think what makes cloud different is that it's based on commodity, uh, it's based on standards, uh, and it's not uh, forcing you to use a different set of architectures and APIs in order to solve the problems. Uh, one of the things that you've talked about uh, in your role uh, here at NASA is that um, by adopting certain open source projects, you can help to codify or encourage the use of certain standards. What standards do you see evolving for cloud computing, and which ones uh, do you find useful at NASA? Yeah, so kind of walking down the stack, uh, I think from, from an application perspective, I would really like to see all of our applications be delivered over the web uh, using standards like HTML5. Uh, I think that if we can move in that direction, we can be device agnostic with our employees and our, our stakeholders. So if you're able to use an iPad or if you're able to use a laptop or you're able to use a desktop or even an iPhone to interact with your applications, uh, that's, the, that's the future of the application is, is standards based applications based on HTML. Now, on the platform side, I think that there are a lot of different options there. And what we don't want to do is impose certain languages or, or frameworks on people who are building applications. Mm -hmm. um, on the infrastructure side, we want to use, uh, we don't want to impose operating systems or particular kinds of uh, storage approaches either. So it's all about providing options, and it's about leveraging standards where they exist. And because Nebula is open source, if there are emerging standards or if there are discussions about standards, we can create a reference implementation and test how that how that would work in, a, in an operational environment, which I think is a unique opportunity we have with the NASA Nebula program. Now, um, one of the things you're looking at is also, uh, like you said, expanding um, Nebula's use for other agencies. And because it's open source, um, it's something you can make available to them. Uh, how do you manage the code around that? Yeah. Uh, where, do, where will it live? How will the project evolve? Yeah, I mean, I, what we want to do is we want to distance NASA from the code as much as possible. Um, if, this, if the code uh, can live in some sort of foundation or it can live uh, using um, a, a very thin governance process where people from other agencies can, tr can contribute code, where the public can contribute code, uh, we can then look at that code, selectively incorporate it into the services that we provide. That's an ideal scenario. Um, I, d I don't think NASA uh, wants to be in the long term in the IT business or writing infrastructure code to power infrastructure. So the more other agencies get on board with the standards, uh, the more we can see Nebula uh, instances become interoperable 
across the federal government. Now, I know we shouldn't get too bogged down in the clouds, although sure. it's certainly tempting just to sit and talk about that. Because um, in your role, there's a much broader platform to consider, as yeah. I'm sure you know. Um, how are the ways that NASA is considering using technology for space exploration changing? Um, what are some of your visions for that? Yeah, I mean, I think Moore's Law um, not only affects CPUs and storage, but it also affects the underlying technologies behind sensors. And so we're, we're starting to see higher and higher fidelity sensors uh, aboard spacecraft that pushes on requirements for um, laser communications in space, our deep space networks, um, space-based networks. So I, I think we're going to see a lot of interest in standards emerging around fault-tolerant, delay-tolerant networks, which we're already starting to see in mobile and portable devices and wireless networks here on Earth. So I think there's, there's an increasing amount of overlap between some of the challenges that NASA faces and some of the challenges that um, is, are faced in the consumer space. One uh, example of this is being able to stream 3D games. And you ask, well, what does that have to do with NASA? Well, if you can stream graphics card instructions uh, to a thin client device, um, it really changes the paradigm for how we do visualization at NASA. Um, we can have literally rocket scientists carrying tablets around um, doing really complex visualization happening in the background on supercomputers and just using uh, wireless protocols to stream that and empower them with information that they never had before when they were making decisions. So I, I think we're excited about that. We're excited about um, search streams, uh, data streams that we can understand in real time, uh, make decisions in real time by doing analysis of multiple streams simultaneously. Uh, we're moving away from a world where search is about content and about static web pages, and we're moving into a world where the nuggets of information that you're trying to understand and make decisions around are, are, are small uh, tweets, Twitter uh, feeds and blog feeds and data feeds from sensors. So we're very interested in that as well. Yeah, the uh, information has become atomized and it's where yeah. the uh, semantic web that Tim Berners-Lee is uh, here talking about yeah. um, comes into play in RDF. And I gather he may be visiting NASA later today. Uh, I, in fact, I'm headed over there in a few minutes, so I'm really excited to, to meet him. And NASA is uh, uh, joining the W3C. Um, we were a member uh, a long time ago, and I think uh, our strategy is to embrace standards because we're going to be driving standards now. And I think that's uh, another opportunity for NASA to be part of the conversation, understand what's coming. Uh, before HTML5 is implemented in a browser, it's discussed in standards bodies. Mm -hmm. So I think NASA um, will once again have a seat at the table and will be participating in not only W3C, but also other standards uh, bodies as well. So I've uh, used NASA TV, and it's uh, great to be able to watch the shuttle lift off. Um, and that's one of the many ways that NASA has chosen to engage the public um, using uh, both technology platforms and socially. Um, you know, you use Twitter yourself, uh, see many people on Twitter as well, including the agency. Uh, it's been a uh, important tool, not just that one platform, but many others, in terms of reaching out and pulling the greater conversation um, into NASA. Yep. Uh, what sorts of ways uh, are the public um, and, and you know, scientists, developers, working with NASA to further its mission? And how, how is that reciprocity being yep. realized? I mean, we just saw a presentation um, that I was, I was part of where um, we looked at how JPL was using Azure um, to allow uh, students to classify and count craters on the Mars surface. An important thing to do and something that if we can have uh, students do, not only is it exciting for them, but it provides us data that we wouldn't have otherwise had. We can verify and validate um, in the future. But uh, I think we need to find ways where we can take the rich data that we have and connect with people using these new platforms. You know, how do we, how do spacecrafts interact with Twitter? You know, how do astronauts log? You know, what, what kinds of conversations do we want to have across these different mediums? And I think we're starting to really um, take that, um, take that uh, seriously. And we're looking at new social media policies at NASA. And we're looking at the, not only the technology implications of some of these new platforms, but also the policy implications of some of these new platforms. Yeah, that's uh, the most challenging thing. The security is important, privacy is important, but uh, it all comes back to to people yeah. um, and in terms of, of how you're uh, willing to be open. Uh, NASA is the uh, DNA of a scientific institution, um, but there are, it's made up of thousands and thousands of people, um, including some who do travel into space. Um, how often do you communicate with the folks up at the International Space Station? Well, you know, we got Twitters uh, from ISS just a, a month or two ago. That was, that was exciting. Yes. Yeah, so it uh, looks like we are uh, getting broken into, but I uh, appreciate your time, Chris, and I uh, look forward to seeing you online. As always, thanks. Uh, Thank great you. To see you.